Welcome, it's California Edition. I'm Brad Palmer. It's in Sacramento today. We are joined by Don Wagner. He is a member of the California State Assembly, although he is running for the California State Senate. As we know, Mimi Walters was elected to the U.S. Congress. She actually is the freshman class president for the Republican Caucus, and her seat's now open, and you have announced you'll be running for the Senate. Mimi is an all-star in right, Congress. Right. She, she has endorsed me for that Senate run, which right. I am proud of, and, and it's going to be a special election in uh, March, March right. 17th. The governor recently called it. Let's talk about the whole notion of a special election. I mean, wow, you got two months to gear up for an election while putting voter turnout aside, you would be representing close to a million people. That is bigger than some states, and that is definitely bigger than Mimi's congressional district. State Senate seats are bigger than congressional districts. They are, to my knowledge, the largest legislative districts in right. the, the, the United nation. States. So how do you do it, sir? How do you talk to the voters, a million of them, let's say, in two months? You, you have to be very aggressive. You right. have to be in the mail. You have to be in the district walking and knocking and talking. Right. It's just twice the work for the assembly runs that I've made in the past. Now, is the district compact geographically, or is it more spread out? I'm trying. It's Orange County, so I'm not clear as to. This district is fairly compact, okay. given some of the Senate districts we have in the state of California, right. which, state. Are, which right. are, are extraordinarily right. large mm -hmm. um, because of the population. The population is very compact in Orange County, and it's it's a much more manageable right. geographic. So district. you currently represent about half the district. What are some of the cities in your district now? Um, the cities that in, in the, the current district, assembly currently are Anaheim, Orange, Villa Park, okay. Tustin, about a third of Irvine, and Lake Forest. And the Senate district adds those same cities, and then it picks up the rest of Irvine. It adds a portion of Huntington Beach, okay. Costa Mesa, Newport Beach, Laguna Beach. Laguna Woods. So those cities, I know Orange County fairly well, seem fairly similar uh, in terms of demographic makeup, maybe a little more affluent on the coast. So do you see that the issues in the assembly seat versus the larger Senate seat, are they different? Are they? They are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. and, and prior to redistricting, I was privileged to represent the western part oh, of okay. the district. With the change, I now have the eastern part. There are some different issues. On the coast, um, you'll, you'll see a little bit more of some of the traditional environmental okay. uh, issues take, uh, take a little right. bit of a higher priority with some of the folks on the coast. But by and large, people want this economy to be strong. They want their children educated, and that's true throughout the Senate district. It's true in my assembly district. It's true throughout the state of California. So looking at the numbers, it's a Republican seat for whatever that may mean. But when you think about a Republican seat, that can mean different things in our great state. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be kind of traditional conservative Republicans that are more focused on business issues, um, regulatory issues, tax issues, and then there may be conservative Republicans more focused on social issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, it could be um, marriage equality or abortion rights, whatever it may be. W where does this district fall? I, I see this district as somewhat in the middle on those issues. Oh, I see. There are some districts, some of the more rural sure. districts, that uh, that perhaps are heavier in some of the social issues. Right. Um, this district, because it is, I mean, it is just such a marvelous right. district. It really, I mean, I, I think about those cities. I was just in Dana Point for a quick vacation. I went to Fashion Island in the district. It I'm is. Sure. The, yeah. It is the best district <laughs> in the state beautiful. of California. Right. It is. It, it has an enormously broad uh, tax base. Mm -hmm. um, business matters a lot there, but quality of life matters as what well. What about you know Orange County? People may not realize this, but it is increasingly diverse. Mm -hmm. um, a wonderful Asian American community, terrific uh, Latino communities as well. And so, you know, we have in the past thought about Orange County as being, you know, very whatever you want to say, European, whatever you want to say, but now it's different. And so how are you talking to the, the more diverse Orange County? That is a great question. Mm. And and Brad, the, the answer is the issues to that I've talked about mm out in those communities, again, are the right. same issues. Um, I don't, you know, I don't care a where you come from, you want your small business mm -hmm. to be, you know, you want the government out of the way. Right. You want your children to have quality education. Um, the, but, but you're right, Orange County has changed dramatically. I've been there since 1991. Wow. It has changed dramatically in those few years. But we, we've had, as you see, several of these ethnic communities are right. bringing an enormous amount of talent 
um, an enormous amount of hard work into uh, into Orange County. And what we've been able to do, at least in the Republican Party, right. very successfully is tap into it. We have uh, Young Kim, a, the first right. Korean-American Republican, uh, is up out of Orange right. County. We have Janet Wynn right. in the Senate, the first Vietnamese-American. We have Ling Ling Chang, Chinese-American, right. uh, out of Orange County right. as well. And so, so we are responding because those are the people who we're elected to serve. So you get out, you talk to them, you tell them what you're about, and you hear what they have to say. And people want jobs. They want uh, an education. But, but you mentioned education, and I think about the Irvine School District and the Newport Mesa School District. I mean, these are some of the best districts in the state. I mean, Irvine, Absolutely. Unified, forget it. You know, I, I wish I could go there. And so, you know, given that things are going pretty well, you know, how do you kind of get mot folks motivated to the polls? You know, things are going well in, in the, what's the number of the district? The, well, yeah. this is the 37th 37, Senate yeah. district. I mean, things are going well. Well, and, and the truth of the matter is that historically, the turnout in special elections has been very low. Oh, abysmal. And, and, you know, in some ways, that's a good thing. If, if folks are saying, my school is good, right. you know, things are fine, I, I'm, I'm okay with the mm -hmm. status quo, they're not going to come out to the polls as much as if things are terrible and they're looking to go out and, and, and fix something. Mm. Um, it would be nice to have a sure. have much more voter participation. But in this state, we just went through a general election. It was one of the worst turnouts ever. ever. And uh, some of the special elections that have been called over the course of the last several years have had very, very small turnout. Oh, we'll I, I, live, I live in Los Angeles County, and just by fluke, in my community, I had a special, within a year, for the state senate, the state assembly, a school board, LA City County. I mean, it was painful. I was getting absentee ballots, you know, every single day, generals and primaries, and it can be rough. I want to ask about an issue that a lot of folks uh, in your caucus are talking about. That's high-speed rail. Uh, we know the governor recently, in a grand gala, had the groundbreaking of high-speed rail in Fresno. Is it an issue that is on top of mind in Orange County? Are people talking about high-speed rail? It doesn't. I don't know. To me, it doesn't feel like it's not. It's the top of agenda. But is it? It, it has been uh -huh. in the past when when there were legal challenges. When there sure. were uh, when it was in the news. Right. It was a big issue, and by and large, in Orange County, we are not in favor of okay. it. Certainly, I'm not. It has been kind of quiet lately. Right. Right. But but the bottom line is the issue is still out there. The public still is not convinced, and rightly so, that this will pencil out. That they'll ever have an opportunity to ride on this high-speed train and that this is the right place for us to be spending our resources. I'm just, it's not. I'm just wondering, though, you know, look, politics is the art of compromise. And for better, for worse, this governor wants high-speed rail, you know, and there are so many places for compromise, it, it, regulatory reform, uh, uh, tax reform, you know. Well, is it one of those that at a certain level you just got to say, I think I think high speed rail is something else rather than than ripe for ref, for, for mm. compromise. Right. You know what's the compromise? We only build it half well, up and down the could state. Could the compromise be okay, Governor? You want this? Have fun. But we want pension reform, regulatory reform, tax reform, sequel here, reform. Here, here's here is mm. in my mind the problem with that. Right. There is not the kind of. Uh, political pressure yet to do that sort of reform. Mm -hmm. The governor isn't talking about any reform whatsoever. He wants his high-speed rail, and that's it. What we hear is it's a legacy issue for the governor. Right. And what I would want to suggest to the governor is that perhaps a, a more appropriate legacy for him and for the legislature is let's fix our our um, colleges and universities. Oh, oh, okay. Let's spend yeah. some money there and and bring those into the 21st century. Uh, his father did a great job back 50 years ago. Right. It's time to update, say, the master plan for higher education. Let's spend money there. There are there are currently a lot of infrastructure issues the state has, not just the roads, but right. the ports, the rails, the uh, electricity, the water. You'll come we got to go there. I'm You'll come back. Glad to come back. He is a member of the California State Assembly, running for the California State Senate. He is uh, Don Wagner. I'm Brad Pomerantz. It's California edition. <laughs> Thank you. Man. That
Welcome to California Edition. My name is Brad Palmer. It's we're in Sacramento today. We are joined by Devin Mathis. He is a new member of the California State Assembly. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. A tremendous victory. And I want to speak with you about how you've now entered this august body. You've been named vice chair of the Veterans Affairs Committee, yes. a tremendous honor. And for those of us that haven't met you yet, it's apropos. Yeah, you you, ha you are a veteran. You served our country admirably for a long time. Talk to us about that. Well, I, uh, I joined the National Guard out of high school. I wanted to, you know, not only serve our country, but also serve our state. Mm. And, you know, I come from a military family. Right. My older brother's a West Point graduate. Ah. Um, so it was kind of natural to go down that road. And I was actually at basic training during 9-11, oh. Fort Sill, Oklahoma. So that was kind of world changed a little bit. Yeah, for you and everyone. But um, came home and moved back down to my hometown of Porterville and ended up getting deployed in 2003 to right. go to Iraq with the transportation unit out of San mm. Bruno. We know that you took two tours to Iraq. Yes. You received how many Purple Hearts? One Purple Heart. Right. Um, that was my 2007-2008 deployment. Mm. Um, I was a lead vehicle commander mm -hmm. uh, running joint logistical convoy operations. So we would pick up from the ports in Kuwait and drive as far north as Mosul. So I could drive you a roadmap of, you know, downtown Baghdad Who or the entire thought? state. I know. Um, so my primary job was to navigate, mm -hmm. uh, stay updated on enemy situations, things like that. And uh, the second roadside bomb kind of knocked me out, had uh, two weeks of my life kind of in and out, kind of like at the beginning of Saving Private Ryan when they take the beach and it's kind of black and white. I know what you're saying. I got yeah. two weeks of my life that are like right, that. Right, right. Um, so I came back home in 2008. As we know, 2008 right. was the recession, no jobs. So I took the opportunity to finally go to college and I went to Portoville City and I had a few really good professors. Uh, I'll give a shout out to them. Uh, right. Richard Osborne, Richard Good, right. uh, Steve Schultz, and uh, Rosa Carlton down there. And it's hard to deny that when you were there, you, re you, you found your calling in a lot of ways. Yes. You found your calling. You became incredibly involved in supporting veterans. You yes. became a leader in various veterans organizations and ultimately pursued a degree that would allow you to continue to serve your fellow vets. Yeah, let, let me let me tell you Please. a little bit about that. Um, at Portoville City, I became Veterans Club President and the California State Board of California Community Colleges. Not sure why we have California in there twice. <laughs> right. um, anyhow, they came to Portoville to ask, what do veterans need on college campuses? Mm -hmm. And we had a really good meeting. Things sounded great. We talked about veteran centers on college campuses. Uh, bringing veteran service officers to the campus. That way veterans didn't have to go to the county seats and find them. Right, right. They would be there already on campus, which would make it a lot easier. These are things I'm going to work with Jackie Irwin on. Yes, now Jackie Irwin um, will be your, is your colleague. Yes. She is chair of Veterans Affairs. Yes. And I have to say, I interviewed her recently, and she clearly was pleased that you are her vice chair, that you are two partners in crime, if I can say, on this very important not, committee. Not quite yet. Exactly. Well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's nice to see the relationship starting off with such mutual respect. Yes. Right. Um, so anyhow, we had this mm -hmm. meeting. I walked out, and I looked at my professors, and I go, how do I get a degree to make what we just talked about in there? How do we make that actual policy? How, you know, how, how do you turn that into black and white instead of just talk? And they go, you need a degree in public administration. I had no idea what it was at the time. You know, at the time I was going to be uh, looking into being a PTSD counselor. Mm -hmm. I figured being a sergeant, I could help other veterans coming home because after the roadside bombs of and the course. Purple Heart, I was you know. no longer able to deploy. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, how can I better serve, better help my guys? And with the public administration piece, it just kind of made sense. Something clicked there because it was not only can I help veterans, but to help a veteran, you got to help their family, you help their community, you know, you help the economy. I mean, everything correlates, everything's tied in. But it's one thing to decide to pursue a career that helps veterans. It's another entirely different matter to decide to run for office. Enter Sacramento 
and then dedicate yourself by requesting and receiving the vice chairmanship yes. of Veterans Affairs. I mean, you, you're walking the walk and talking the talk. <laughs> you're for real, sir. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so as you look at the Veterans Affairs Committee, what are your hopes and dreams? What do you hope to achieve over the next it's, presumably 12 years? Well, I mean, I've, I've got a, a long list of right. veterans' concerns. I've been doing veteran advocacy for five years. Right. Um, from president of the Veterans Club. Right. Uh, when I transferred to Fresno State, I joined fraternity Omega Delta Sigma, uh -huh. which is the national veteran fraternity. Uh -huh. I started out as philanthropy chair, moved to vice president, and then president of the fraternity Shocking. by the time I graduated <laughs> in 2013. Ah, so, recent grad, congrats on that. Um, and I'm now currently the national vice president of the fraternity. So, and what they do is they provide a support group for veterans on college campuses. Which is exactly your belly. Oh, it, it, it's great because for a lot of veterans, you leave that support group you have at home, and a lot of guys start out at community college, but when you transfer, mm -hmm. you're leaving that support group behind. Right, right. And this kind of fills that void and gives the camaraderie that you had while you're in service because the fraternity provides that brother. Right. Right. And I mean, we're open, we're co ed, and everything else. Of course, yeah. So, I mean, it's great. It's a great place. It's been a great part of my life. When I, I love think it. about your home, Porterville, um, that really, in a lot of ways, is ground zero for our state route. Yes, and well, it's the epicenter. It literally, so. I mean, literally. And I think about your neighbors and how they must be struggling. Yes, we've had rains recently, but you can tell me better than I can tell our viewers, the rains aren't gonna do it. No. So talk to me about your neighbors. Talk to me about how, how are they doing during these very difficult times. Yeah, it's, well, you said it, they're struggling. Right. Um, and it's not just Eastside Porterville. There's a Finney track in Tulare. Mm -hmm. um, there's quite a few other areas. And basically what it is is our area, we got a 0% allocation for water this the past year. From the year, state water from project. From the state water yeah. project. So that's something I'm going to be working on to make sure mm. that never happens again. Good, good. Because um, it's killing us down there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you literally have people who cannot turn on tap water. And, and you're not being hyperbolic. It is true. There are portions of the state, including in your assembly district, where there is no water. I mean, we, yeah. for those of us in urban centers, we don't realize this is 2015. This is happening. Yes. Well, no, it's literally conditions that I saw in Iraq. <laughs> and it, yeah. it's hard for me to see that in my hometown. Right. Because I grew up there. Uh, my family's from there. And to see people without water... I mean, this is, these are third world country problems happening in the state of California. And yet we have, what, the seventh, eighth largest economy in the world? But have we turned a corner, you know, this, the water bond did pass. I know money's not flowing down yes. yet, but, you know, we did have some rains. So is it a little better or is it as dramatic and dire it's, as it was last well, year? Well, I mean, you got to think about it. Right now, people can't turn on water. But yet we yeah, we have. Here we are, yeah, with our water, water right, right here. So, I mean, we... What they're doing currently is sending bottled water. They're providing, you know, mm -hmm. tanks of water, you know, with trucks coming through right. to fill them. You know, there's issues of is this potable water, non-potable right. water, um, environmental standards on the containers. Sure. What about the fields? I mean, we are the Salad Bowl to America. Yes. How, how, is Tulare well, more dairy? I'm trying to remember. What it's, it's We have a lot of dairy. Right. We have a lot of citrus. Uh-huh. Um, we were number one in ag this past year. Oh, good. Okay. So, I mean, when you're looking at it, it's okay. We're number one in ag. How do we keep that? Right, right. But we're also number one with people out without water. Mm. And there's a balance that we got to figure out so we can take care of everybody. And that's my biggest thing. Is that, you know, I didn't come here. I didn't run as a party politics, partisan kind of guy. I ran as, you know, same thing in the military. You take care of your people. Right. And that's my job. You know, and I told people during the race, it's, look, you know, Never once did I go to a job and go, hey, man, are you a Democrat or Republican? Can I work with you? <laughs> you know, my job is to go and represent the people and take care of them and You're to get lucky the to job have you. done. You're lucky to have you. His name is Devin Mathis. He is a member of the California State Assembly. My name is Brad Pomerantz, and this is California Edition. Thank you.
Welcome, it's California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz in Sacramento today. We are joined by Rocky Chavez. He is a member of the California State Assembly, but he is a rumored candidate for the United States Senate. And I can say that because I've read it. And if you want to affirm or deny, it's up to you. But Mr. Chavez, I understand you may be thinking about running for the seat currently held by Barbara Boxer. That's what I've read in the LA Times. Right, so exactly. So it must be true. It must be. So do talk to us about your thought process. You're a Republican member of the California State Assembly, representing San Diego, a Latino man. And so, you know, one could create an argument that maybe this is a viable candidacy. Well, I think the uh, important thing about California is that we have huge issues in education. And when you're mm. talking about education, who's not being taken care of, it's the Latino community. 60% mm. of the young men don't even graduate from high school. Right. And so I think a Republican who's from Los Angeles, right. born and raised in Los Initially. LA, right. Initially, mm -hmm. who can go back and talk to the Latino community about the importance of education and what Republicans offer for solutions that uh, they'll be listened to. There's no question the Republican Party would love to have a Latino voice at the helm. Uh, a couple of years ago, Abel Maldonado, folks thought he may be that voice, but he was arguably chased out for being too moderate. Uh, you are perceived at some level as being somewhat moderate. And so how do you bridge the gap with your own party, uh, yet be able to appeal uh, to a larger electorate in California, which tends to be bluer than redder? I think uh, we, if you look actually look at the votes that I've taken, the positions mm -hmm. I've taken, uh, I'm no taxes, mm -hmm. efficient government, right. responsible government, um, and the support of the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. Those are Republican positions. Right. But I also believe um, that uh, there's value in diversity of the uh, individuals. Mm -hmm. I support uh, residency. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to invest in people. I, uh, well, let's talk about immigration. I care about the environment. Yeah, let's talk about the immigration issue because obviously that's a very significant one. As we speak today, there's a big rift in Washington. Still, uh, members of the Republican Party representing us in D.C. are opposed to President Obama's actions to ease uh, immigration, uh, those that are in this country, giving them some tor uh, type of residency. Where would you stand on that? Well, you know, in 2012, when I recently got elected mm -hmm. on the immigration reform issue, on the steps of the Capitol here in San, uh, mm. Sacramento, I was one of two assembly members of the Republicans that said we need to have immigration reform. Mm. That was 2012. Right. When we took the vote in the fall of 2012, I had convinced 17 assembly members to sign on for immigration right. reform. Right. So this is something I just fell out on yesterday. Right. This You're is right. something right. I, I strongly You've been believe. On this. I belong to mm. believe that there's, mm. there's value to a vibrant society. And so uh, when you start talking to Republicans about it and how you can ensure that we can manage the borders, mm -hmm. notice the word manage, oh, man I hear you. Ma manage the borders uh, and respect our laws, there's also a way to be respectful of families because Republicans are about families. Right. So, but Okay. So you continue to speak like what many Californians believe, and, but many Californians are just so used to pushing that Democratic lever. And so in a general election, how would you get them to pull the Republican lever? Uh, it would be in 2016, which will be a, a big year, a uh, presidential race. And, you know, presidential candidates in the past have not paid attention to California because it has been blue. Well, there's a Republican slice, about 30 percent, 29 percent. Right. right. There's a decline to state supplies, which is about 27, 29 percent. And growing. And growing. And uh, a lot of them, I believe, are Republicans who have left. All right. So you get a good percent of those. Let's right. say you get 70 percent. Right. And then there's that element of the uh, Democratic group, which we are Latino. Right. And, and now you're at 51, 52 percent. And, and Central off, Valley Democrats. That's exactly who right. Who vote Republican for oh. Jeff Denham and Valadeo. And so... <laughs> never know. His name is Rocky Chavez. He is a member of the California State Assembly thinking about running for the U.S. Senate. I'm Brad Pomerantz. It's California Edition. I mean, there It's California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz, and we are joined by Dr. Gaelic Help Jackson. She 
is Miss Senior California 2014 mm -hmm. 15. Madam Queen, nice to meet you. Thank, Thank you for being you. here. How I'm does privileged. one become Miss Senior California? Well, you go to a preliminary pageant. Right. And you are judged on four categories of gown and talent and philosophy and interview. And then if you're very, very lucky, right. then you are crowned the queen. And you so. <laughs> are with the queen for this year. And yes. I have to say, the minute you walked in, I felt it. I oh, knew it. Well, thank you, my and radiance. It, you are radiating. <laughs> and so talk to us about what you are doing as Miss Senior California, because that really is yes. what this is about. Yes. It's about talking. Yes. Talking to the seniors. Well, first of all, you know, to go around and promote right. uh, senior women. And, and we call it the age of elegance, you know, right. 60 years and older. And uh, because we are vibrant, we are wise, we have been through everything that is going on today in the news and all that. And I think about your generation, uh, essentially a generation that lived the 20th century, lived Absolutely. through, you know, possibly the end of World War II, Korea, Vietnam. Uh, you yes. can have downturns. I mean, you really lived through the facts and the, and the telephone and, and the television and yes. the cell phones. I mean, you've lived it all. Yes, I remember the first, we had the first television on our block and all that. One of your platforms, not surprising given what you've lived through, veterans. Yes, the, absolutely. And tell us about veterans and why they are so near and dear to you uh, and what you're doing to promote veterans. My family from the Revolutionary War on has fought in every single okay. war. And Are you has, a Mayflower baby? Uh, not, not quite, but I had close. a physician who helped on the Mayflower. Okay, okay. there you have it. There you have it. But still, <laughs> but, daughter of the American Revolution. Uh, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm DAR and mm -hmm. all that. And I am so proud. And I still have in the military who've, who've been in Afghanistan mm -hmm. and uh, all the wars. And it, through time, our belief in our veterans and our belief in our men who are fighting in the military has just gone down and down and down. And they are such fabulous men and they need such support and their families need such support. Although I wonder if you would agree that there is no doubt that our veterans coming home from Vietnam, they face challenges with integration. Oh we weren't goodness. as welcoming. But it yes. feels like now with Afghanistan, with Iraq, We've learned our lesson that these men and women deserve our love and support. It has gotten better. It right. has, but they still don't get the support that they need and the family support that they need. But and you're the helping with support. that. Absolutely. Tell us about what you do with some of your uh, partners in crime, I guess you could say, <laughs> some of the other ladies that are part of Miss Senior California. What are you doing? We entertain. Right. We go to senior facilities with veterans that are there and we perform for them all pro bono. We go to military bases and perform. Uh, I myself, I'm a marriage and family therapist and I help families at PTSD with the military men who come home and need support mentally, physically, and their families. I have to ask you what your family thinks of this. Your husband, your daughters, your grandchildren. They are extremely proud. I love that. And extremely. They pushed you a bit into this, no? I didn't want to do it. Right. At first I thought, Thought, this is crazy you right. know being a beauty queen right, you know right. and save the world I'm going to please and you know. were you a beauty queen when you were younger no not so at all not I was a businesswoman so no. talk to us about that moment when you were crowned oh. it must have been crazy when <laughs> I I mean to win a preliminary is very That's difficult a big moment. then to win Miss Senior California I mean I was stunned I I, I wanted to say Recount! <laughs> right. No, something's wrong here. Would it? No, I was absolutely stunned and I was thrilled out of my mind. It is my honor to have met you, Madam Queen. Thank Her name you. is Dr. Gayla Kelp Jackson. She is Miss Senior California 2014 and 15. I'm Brad Pomerantz. It's California Edition. Thank you.